Welcome to an entry in our exclusive Three Steps to Gladiator series. We built these guides from the ground up to help players go from zero to Gladiator, even on a spec that they've never played before. Step 1 covers building your character and is essentially everything you need to get started once you hit level 120 on your class of choice. Step 2 builds upon that by preparing you for two of the most important skills to have in Arena. Finally, Step 3 walks you through how to get the best results when entering the Arena. Now, we're excited to announce that throughout December, we'll be bringing you daily releases on the second step in this series for all of the specs that you see on screen right now. So, if you're looking to kickstart your climb to Gladiator on any of these popular specs, be sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell to be notified the moment your guide goes live. And head on over to skillcap.com slash wow if you're interested in checking out the rest of the series along with hundreds of other exclusive BFA guides. Alright, let's get into today's Step 2 release. Enjoy! Hey guys, Zot here, and welcome to Step 2 of our Three Steps to Gladiator Guide for Discipline Priest. If you missed Step 1, be sure to check that out first. In Step 2, we're going to be covering preparing for PvP, including how you can min-max your healing to keep your team alive, how you can be efficient with your mana, and how to also utilize your crowd control. So let's get started. Discipline Priest is one of the hardest healers to master. Knowing when to play aggressive and when to heal is something Discipline Priest has to constantly think about, as its strength lies in how aggressive you can play and how you can assist your team with damage. With that being said, let's take a look at your basic healing rotation and then talk about the spells a little more in depth. Now, this is what makes Discipline Priest strong. The idea of healing with damage. You can apply this with Power Word Shield, Shadow Mend and even Power Word Radiance. However, the main way you apply this is with Power Word Shield. And if you're playing Trinity, it's the only way that you can. To min-max your healing as a Discipline Priest, you want to maximize your time spent healing via Atonement, which can be done via your damage and spells. So Smite, Penance, Purge the Wicked, Fiend, Solace, and also Schism. These are only spells that contribute to Atonement, and any third-party damage from Trinkets, Azurite procs, or even Essences do not count. Now, the majority of your atonement healing is actually going to come from your Perch the Wicked. This is why it's important to keep this dot up on multiple targets if possible. The easiest way to understand this is to just think of one Perch the Wicked as one rejuvenation for a target with atonement. Perch the Wicked also deals very good damage and also gives you power of the dark side procs, increasing the healing and damage of your next penance. Now, Solace also contributes a large amount to your overall healing. This ability hits hard and does good atonement healing, so make sure to get into the habit of using this off cooldown. Shadow Fiend or Mindbender, if you're playing it, should again be used off cooldown. However, deals some underestimated damage and thus healing. This means if your team is about to do a setup, you can delay this cooldown for a few seconds to assist in damaging. Smite is just your basic filler heal. If people are at a stable amount of health, and at not a risk of dying, then just spam smites. It costs next to no mana and also applies an absorption to the enemy target, making their damage dealt being absorbed. Look to heal with this wherever possible, however you can't rely on it to top people, as the healing isn't really that strong, so use as a tool when you're already ahead on healing. Schism, if talented, is your biggest burst heal from atonement. Not only does it hit hard, but it also applies a 40% damage taken debuff to the target meaning your spells are going to be hitting harder and thus you're going to be dishing out more healing. When using Schism, look to then combine it with a Penance and a Power Word Solace, and then maximize your smites during its uptime. Your Shadow Fiend and Mindbender do not get affected by Schism, however. Penance is unique in the fact you can either use it as a direct heal or as a damage to heal via Atonement. We'll cover Penance in more depth later in this video. Okay, so if you've fallen behind and the healing from your atonement just isn't going to heal through the pressure, then you're going to have to start casting standard heals, which are Shadow Mend, Penance, and in some rare cases, Radiance. This is your main tool to recover when behind. It's a heavy mana cost ability, but does decent direct healing. When playing Masochism versus Melee, you'll want to at least be casting this every 10 seconds to maintain the damage reduction you'll find yourself having to cast this very often against high single target compositions. 
as healing via atonement just won't be able to reliably keep up with the healing required. Now, Radiance is a last resort, and it's only ever worth using if you're number one, specting to ultimate Radiance, and number two, using at least one Enduring Luminescence trait. This does some good healing, but the mana cost is absurd. Only take this when you know the game is going to be short, and you just need to survive that little bit longer. I wanted to do a section on Penance because of the use of this ability is quite complex, as essentially it's a damaging ability, an AoE heal, but also a strong single target heal. First the rules, if you're playing Contrition, you obviously never want to use it offensively, unless you're going to secure a kill with it, as you've just completely wasted playing the talent. Second, Penance is your most efficient heal altogether, both AoE and also single target. It costs low mana and does good healing. So. When should you use it on an enemy and when should you use it on a teammate? Well, it's honestly simple. Take a look at this healing breakdown. The first three ticks of penance are with schism and offensive. The second is obviously a friendly penance and the third is a normal offensive penance without schism. This means if you need single target healing, always do a friendly penance, even if you have schism up. Penance will still do more healing when used on a friendly target. If you need AoE healing or your versus a rock composition, then Penance should always be used offensively, as every tick of Penance is going to be healing multiple targets if you have Atonement up. And the last use of Penance is obviously just purely as a damage tool. Again, just use some common sense. If the target is incredibly low or your team is doing a setup, you can just throw in an offensive Penance to help score the kill. Okay then, so what are your healing goals? Well, your overall goal as a Dissonant Priest is to maximise using these abilities to heal, as healing via Atonement is not only mana efficient, but also assists in damage, obviously, meaning you're going to be putting out very good pressure and helping your team win the game. If you can't utilise Atonement, then there is no reason to be playing a Disciplined Priest, as almost any other healer has stronger heals than you. Now, the trick to maximise your time spent healing with Atonement is by trading defensive cooldowns proactively, so you don't fall behind. Discipline Priest has no fail safe buttons like Spirit Link or Hand of Sacrifice. This means you need to be using your defensives and healing cooldowns before the damage goes out. This is going to increase your time spent healing with Atonement and less time on recovering with Shadow Mend, Penance or in the worst cases Radiance. What I mean by proactively is trading them for offensive cooldowns popped by your enemy. So let's take a look at your defensive cooldown lineup. Pain Suppression is just a flat out 40% damage reduction on one target that can be used while stunned. If you're in a stun and know you're going to be taking heavy damage or even if you're crowd controlled and you know your teammate is going to be taking heavy damage, be sure to use this beforehand. Again, same as Pain Suppression, Barrier follows the same rules but cannot be used while stunned. So say for instance a DK pops Abomination on you and you can't get away or a Mage pops Combustion on your teammate, look to use the barrier to counter the damage before it goes out. Now the same rules also apply to Rapture. You want to use this once more as an answer to strong offensive cooldowns popped from your enemy. Use it early and use it efficiently. Rapture costs a global cooldown and does zero healing, only shields. So be careful using it as an attempt to save a teammate as it can be purged and then you've just essentially wasted two globals for zero healing. Up next, let's cover mana efficiency. With mana becoming more important in this meta than ever, games are often won or lost on your blue bar and there is a few things you can do to make it last that little bit longer. Now, we touched on this earlier, but if you're having mana problems, this is one of the easiest fixes. Just simply swap your essences. Lucid Dream as a major or minor can equate to some nice mana regeneration over the course of a game, much needed if you know the game is coming to go down onto mana. This is also the same case with the ever rising tide as a minor. You don't ideally want this as a major however, but the minor effect can help solve some mana issues. These are your two biggest ways to gain mana. Both Mindbender and Shadow Fiend, if you're using them, restore a decent chunk of your mana back. Make sure you are using them when off cooldown, ideally during a setup from your team. As for Solace, this ability should never be on cooldown. Make sure you're utilising it the second it comes up. Good damage, good healing and even restores mana, so don't waste it. Now, some spells cost a lot more mana than others, namely Shadow Mend, Radiance and also to a lesser extent Power Word Shield. Ideally, you want to minimise the use of these abilities, only using them when required. You can do this by maximising your time spent healing via Atonement. If somebody is 90%, 
don't cast a shadow man to top them, instead let your atonement get them to fall. This will save you some much needed mana. And our last point to be mana efficient is something we've again touched on, and that's trading defensive cooldowns. If you see a rogue and a mage pop say Vendetta and Combustion, it's going to cost you a lot of mana to heal through the damage. Instead, just trade a defensive cooldown, be it Rapture, Barrier, even PS, just reduce some of the incoming damage. Now we've got a much more in-depth understanding about Discipline Priest healing and how it works as a whole, let's talk about crowd control. Disc not only brings good damage and offensive pressure, but they can also assist you with crowd control. You have three main crowd controls, Psychic Scream, Mind Control and Shining Force. Psychic Scream can be one of those abilities that does more harm than it does good, if you don't put it into practice well. What I mean by this is that it's an 8 yard range ability. So to land this, you're going to have to be near to melee range. This means a lot of the time you'll have to sacrifice your position or even run across the entire map to land it. This is why it's a risky ability. You don't want to run across the map to land a fear only to get polymorphed on your way. Always consider the benefits and talk to your team beforehand. As a result, it's usually best to use Psychic Scream as a follow up crowd control from another CC. This means if your ally is example a mage, let him land a polymorph and then push for the fear. This will give you a much higher chance of landing it and not make you spend the entire game chasing someone for a fear. Now, mind control is a tricky one and it's extremely situational. The main uses you'll find for this is first simply as a replacement for Psychic Scream or even as a way to extend some crowd control chains. Secondly, you can use it as a way to keep targets low. Say for instance your CC has ended and you want to keep your main kill target low on health. You can then mind control them to deny healing. This is usually only effective if the enemy team lacks an offensive purge. Thirdly is mind controlling people from platforms. So for instance on Blade's Edge and other Z-Axis maps, you can mind control the target down, forcing them to have to waste time going all the way back up. Mind control is also on a different school to the majority of your heals. This means it can be a great way to force interrupts onto your shadow school. And our last and extremely niche use is the advanced tricks. We have a separate guide on this involving a bit more information, but you can mind control things like Touch of Death, Enemy Mage's Ring of Frost and a few other cool things. But as a general rule with mind control, just be careful whilst doing it. If you don't, weigh up the pros and cons. You don't want to mind control an enemy healer for example, why should DPS just die in the process? Shining Force is taken instead of reduced cooldown Psychic Scream. Taken primarily when you know you won't get use out of Psychic Scream or when on some specific maps whilst being trained. The first primary use is obviously knocking targets off either you or a teammate. Great again when up against melee cleaves or on Z-Axis maps to either knock them down off the platform or build distance. The secondary use is for positional requirement defensive abilities, for instance Darkness, Power Word Barrier and Urban Wall Totem. You can use this on an ally to knock enemies out of these defensives. Alright then guys, that's it for part 2, preparing for PvP. Stay on the lookout for part 3, which will be covering the rest of the information you need in order to push Gladiator, including compositions and what your objectives actually are once you finally get into the game.